the 10 commandments for managing a contractor during rehab. So the number one reason good deals turn south or go bad really has a lot to do with bad contractors. Now, I know plenty of great contractors, but I know far more bad ones than I do good ones. But the truth is that I have also seen many mismanaged jobs, nickel and dime, change orders, taking too long, or even contractors walking away from the project entirely. This is just crazy, I know, but I've seen it time and time again. But now, I rarely have those problems. And the reason is, is because I follow my contractor rules, these 10 rules, these 10 commandments. Rule number one is line by line item breakdown. What we call this is the scope of work. And so one of the things that I like to do is I walk through the project with the contractor and we put together a scope of work of what's actually gonna be done. Now, this doesn't include pricing at this point. Um, this is basically the scope of work um, that's going to be done to the property. And we walk through and I write all that down. Now. I, in the past, I have used a um, uh, recording device and I've recorded everything that's said and I've gone back and listened to it. I used to have one of those pens that as I wrote, it would uh, also record um, what's being said. This isn't to try and get somebody in trouble. This is to make sure we have a meeting of the minds and we're on the same page. But either way you look at this, you've got to come up with your contractor with a scope of work, which is basically what are we doing? That's the most important thing we've got to do. Then the second thing we've got to do, number two, is we've got to do a, a line by line item breakdown. So once we've walked the property, we've determined what's going to be done to the property. Now we have to document this, what is actually going to be done to the property. And so we use a specialized form to do that, to do this, to make sure that we don't have any concerns. Now, this is all before we have actually gotten any prices um, from the contractor yet, right? So we may have have some idea of prices and that type of stuff, but we don't have it finalized yet. Um, we can say, how much you think this will cost? How much you think this will cost? Then the contractor needs to think about it or get some pricing and check materials and that type of stuff. But the first thing is we're walking the job and getting the scope of work. And the next thing is it's a line by line item breakdown. Now, who does that? I do that, not the contractor. See, contractors hate paperwork. They hate writing things down. They think everybody's gonna remember everything. And here's what I can tell you, is most times people forget. Either I forget or they forget or a combination of both. And that's why documenting everything becomes so important. Okay, so what you're looking at here on the screen is the contractor rehab estimate that I like to use. Now I've taken out some information here, but this is just basic information about the property. This is information about the contractor. But when you come down here, this has specific prices. But right now, what I'm talking about doing is what the scope is. So you can come down here and these are things, these things with check boxes are things that we both have decided are required. Okay. We're on the same page and we're saying, Hey, these things here are required. You know, this is required. Now, if I want something required, I just check it. Now, this is a form we've spent a lot of money and time putting together here, but it breaks everything out. Front landscape, property side, house exterior, structural, electric, kitchen plumbing, bathroom, bedrooms, you know, it just doors, cabinets, paint, miscellaneous, um, you name it, right? So that's everything that we're looking at here. So what happens is on that first time, we do the walkthrough. We come up with a scope, which is basically, what are we doing to these? If it's required, I'm gonna check it on here. And then I can come over here and say, what are we doing? Are we repairing? Are we replacing? Are we upgrading? Are we servicing? Are we cleaning? Are we refinishing um, or other? And then right here, I put in the specifics of what we're actually doing. So that's that initial meeting with the contractor. I'm going to the property. I'm walking through the property. We're making a determination as to what needs to get done. And we're, we're putting the scope of that together. So I'm writing as much as I can down. I'm using this form, okay? Then the next thing that's going to happen is I'm then going to have a pricing meeting with the contractor, right? So I'm going to have a pricing meeting with the contractor. And what's going to happen is we are going to ask them, okay, how much do you think it's going to be? And here you can see we've got two different contractors that have given us pricing on everything. Um, so we have an idea of what the price differences is because we'd like to get two opinions of value when it comes to it. But documenting this and knowing the scope of work is essential to having success 
as a, a fix and flip, as a deal, whether this is a fix and flip, whether this is a project you're liking to do as a rental property, um, if there's repairs being done, you need to be documenting these things uh, to make sure that you are gonna be on the same page. Now, I'm not saying that all contractors are bad or that most contractors are bad or anything like that, but what I'm saying is if you don't have it documented and you are not on the same page with each other, then you're going to be having some problems. That's just how simple it is because things get busy, things get forgotten, things get miscommunicated, and that becomes a really big deal. And having this documented is the ticket to having success. And so that's why that is one of my major 10 commandments um, is making sure that we have everything documented, okay? So we talked about line items. We talked about drafting the scope of work, okay? And making sure everybody's on the same page with that scope of work and making sure we are on the same page with that. Um, we have also talked about making sure we have pricing and those pricings are item by item. One of the big things for me is I make sure that if I'm going to pay out, I pay out by line item. So let me give you an example of this. Let's bounce back over here. Um, I pay out by line item. So for example, the roof has to be 100% done in order to get the $8,000. It's either zero or it's 8,000 and it's 100% or it's nothing. Now, if they wanna break this roof down, we can break the roof down and say, hey, tear off is 2,000 and reshingle is 4,000. And then I'd have a $2,000 line item and a $4,000 line item, okay? And then I could pay out in two different ways. But if it's just one lump sum, exterior trim, it's $1,000, all the exterior trim needs to be done. It's an all or nothing type thing. That's the best way to make sure that you're not getting taken advantage of, okay? Now, number three of our 10 commandments in working with contractors is give them a bonus or a deduction of pay based upon a deadline. So the next thing that we do is we come up with a timeline for the work to actually be done. And then based upon that timeline, I calculate how much my hard money loan costs are, okay? So let's just use some pretty simple math here just to make it kind of easy. Um, let's just say that we're looking at, oh, uh, I don't know. Let's say that there's a loan for $100,000, okay? And let's just say that's at a 15% interest rate. Let's just make things really simple here. So that would be $15,000 a year is what I'd be paying in interest on that type of stuff. So if I take my $15,000 a year um, and I want to get an idea of what this is costing me daily, I take $15,000 divided by 365. Okay. So that ends up being, so I divide that by 365 and that means I'm paying $41. Now that doesn't include any origination or any of that type of stuff, but basically it's cost me $41 a day. Okay. So what I will do with my contractors and say, Hey, if you can get me done early, I will give you $40, $41 a day early. If you can get me every every single day, I'll give you 40 bucks early. But if you're late, you are gonna owe me $80 per day that you're late. And I'm gonna take it out of your final check. See, this helps me because giving them a carrot and a stick is really helpful. And I think that's really important to make sure the contractors uh, do a good job and that you're on the same time, time frame because that can be very expensive. Okay, so on this scope that we've put together and we've put pricing together, the next thing we've got here is a weekly time schedule. Well, we've got several things. We've built a lot into this where this is the contractors we're working with. This is the final bid that the contractor will actually sign, this becomes the weekly schedule. So this basically tells us how long it should be taking to get the work done. Now, if you're working with a big commercial contractor, they do stuff like this. This is called a Gantt chart, which talks about what they're gonna be doing, when they're gonna be doing that type of stuff. But if you're dealing with residential, most contractors don't know how to do this even if they wanted to. So this basically breaks out everything, HVAC, miscellaneous, upgrade, all that type of stuff. And we come in here and we give it dates. So we're gonna begin this one on date one and this is gonna take us three weeks. Um, we're gonna do this on week two, and this is gonna take us two weeks. We're gonna do this on week three, and this is gonna, or week one as well, and this is gonna take us three weeks. So this basically builds out, let's say this is on week four, and this is gonna take us four weeks, right? So this basically builds out our time schedule as to how long the job is actually going to take us so we know what we're gonna be dealing with here. So then it gives us a weekly schedule. So we know week by week, this is the thing 
things that should be worked on, and these are the things that are supposed to be done. When it comes to the end here, this is supposed to be done in week three. This is supposed to be done in week 13. So we meet with a contractor and we go through and say, okay, we've already determined, we've already determined all the work that needs to be done to this property. We've already determined the prices that need to be done to this property. Now we put a weekly schedule together and each week at a minimum, I'm going to the property, meeting with a contractor and telling them, hey, here's what needs to be done week by week. Now we have a meeting and we talk about that in the beginning and then we can come in. And if we have to adjust things, then we can adjust things. Um, but this gives gives us a North Star to be working towards. So we have a weekly schedule of the work that's actually going to be done, which helps immensely in giving us clarity to make sure we are on the same page in getting this stuff done, okay? And that leads me to commandment number four. Commandment number four is check on the property frequently. At a minimum, you need to be there once a week, but I think you should be there two or three times a week. It's amazing how many problems you can avoid if you simply go in there and say, this is the wrong color of tile. Where did you get this from? And that leads me to a little pro tip that I don't even have as my 10 commandments, which is when you're doing this, um, make sure that you give them the material choices, which is actually number five, which is help pick materials and colors. When I first got started, I would tell the contractor to paint and they were like, well, what color do you want to paint? I'm just, well, whatever color you want to paint. And I would come in and it would be ugly colors. And so what I did is I spent some time. Um, I hired a designer to help me. We put together some color palettes and we said, here's the color of carpet. Here's the color of tile. Here's the color of countertops. Here's the color of paint. And we would just do the whole thing. And then I had a little kit that I basically put and I had all of it all put together. And I knew the SKU numbers and everything else. So that way I could tell the painter, this is the color of paint. I tell the carpet guy, this is the color of, of uh, carpet and the kind that we want. I could tell my contractor, this is the tile that we want. And this is the, the item number and where you can buy it from. And we had that all listed out. So then it became very easy to just say, tell the contractor, this is what we do. I could print off a piece of paper and hand it to him and he would know where to go do that. So that's commandment number five. You pick out the materials and the colors. Do not leave it to the contractor because if you leave it to the contractor, he's going to use leftover paint from whatever job he's got and you're going to end up with a rainbow of colors and not really like it in the end. Number six, this is a big one in working with contractors and this is offer more business. You see, contractors wanna have continued business and so we're saying, if you do a great job here, I'll keep using you. Um, I also think it's most important um, that you keep them competitive and knowing that, which leads me to commandment number seven, which is always start with one job, okay? We don't want to give them four jobs at once. I've seen great contractors that got too many jobs that went belly up. And you're gonna say, well, too many jobs, that's probably a good thing, not necessarily. Some contractors can handle more than one job, some contractors can only handle one job, and some contractors can't even handle a job. So you've gotta be careful about that and careful about who you're working with, and you need to make sure you're following these commandments like being on the job frequently. Commandment number eight is get help with pricing. Um, what I wanna say here is make sure you get, get two bids. I like to have two contractor bids on every single job so I have somebody that's there if I run into a problem with my primary contractor, which does happen, um, and I don't wanna be alert. See, the worst thing that could possibly happen is I get into a job and I bid it based upon the work that they were going to do, and now I find out that the, a new contractor comes in and I need more money than what I planned on, and my primary contractor left the job or I can't get in touch with him or who knows where he's gone. That's a major problem I don't wanna be dealing with. So I wanna make sure I've got enough money for multiple contractors if it comes to that, where I can keep the job going and I'm not taking on that risk. If you think about it, as an investor, you're taking on a lot of risk, and if you've only got one guy that says, oh, I'll do the job for you for $30,000, and that's what it used to be like, is they'd write down on the back of a napkin, 30 grand for what? The entire house. And then you start doing construction on the house and be like, well, that's not included and that's not included. And you'd pull up the napkin and be like, for the whole house. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean everything. And that's how this whole system um, came about was because of my trial and error. I had a contractor that I gave money to that was supposed to go buy cabinets that never bought the cabinets. And then it was out $10,000 in cabinets. He never installed them and never showed up. So what did I do? We took him to small claims court. What happened in small claims court? We won. He owed us the $10,000. Guess what? I still haven't seen the money. I'm never going to. So 
These are the types of things you can avoid by paying by line item, breaking it down, doing the scope of work, those things we've been talking about. Okay, number nine is ask questions. Okay, um, you may not know a lot about construction. That's actually great. So you're gonna say, what is this? What does it do? Why is it happening? You wanna be asking questions along the way. The worst thing you can do is not ask questions and do it all at the end. Now, our contractor is gonna love you asking questions, Probably not. It's gonna slow down the job, but what it is gonna do is it's gonna clarify and get every single person on the same page, which is one of the things we do with our walkthrough, with our scope of work, with our pricing meeting, with our timeline meeting, then everybody is on the same page here. And that leads me to number 10, which is do a final walkthrough. Do not pay the final amount until the walkthrough has been done. And I recommend that you hold about 10% with a minimum of $2,500 for that final draw. Meaning if they're asking for a draw, but you're down to your final 10% or $2,500, you don't give them that draw. You say, we'll do that once we have a final walkthrough and everything is 100 100% done because you've got to have enough money in the coffer to make sure they come back and finish some of those things. One of the things you do with a walkthrough is you go through with a blue tape walkthrough. You put tape over there, things that need to be done. Um, that's one of the things that you can actually do is carry some blue tape, some painter's tape. You can put um, you can put tape on things and say, hey, I went by there. I saw a couple things. I need to make sure it gets addressed. So those are 10 commandments that will help you in getting your rehabs done, regardless of what type of rehab project this is, whether it's a fix and flip, whether it's a, a bird deal, whether it's a rental deal, whatever the case is, this will help you immensely. I've got another video, how to sell your finished flips fast and for maximum profit. You're gonna to wanna to check it out. I'll put it on the screen here. Um, we go through when to sell your property yourself, how to know which offers to take, and even a few of my favorite ways to get creative and selling even in a buyer's market. We're gonna talk about that. Check out this video right now. Uh, click on it, you're gonna enjoy it.